Jessica Largi, the chef to cuisine at Manresa Restaurant in Los Gatos, California. Hello, my name is Lawrence Jossel. I'm the chef owner of Nopa here in San Francisco. Taste these, you'll see why they're called butter beans. I've chosen to be a chef in my career because I love to feed people. I started cooking at a very young age. I was 14 years old when I got into the business. I know nothing else, but I love what I do. Burley Hill tomatoes from our friends at Tomatero. Um, spiced chickpeas, mozzarella. There are pickled onions which can be removed with tweezers. Other restaurants put stuff together with tweezers. We just take stuff away with tweezers. Are we overwhelming you guys yet? A bit? Good. I've always wanted to be a chef. I've been cooking since I was about five years old. I went to culinary school straight out of high school and I've been working in fine dining ever since. Four VIP in lacquer and then four other gazpachos. We have 12 people working in the kitchen right now. Table 11, two risotto. Garden next on 11. The most rewarding things about being a chef are feeding people. You know, we do it again and again every single day. There is nothing better to me than giving somebody a plate of beauty. Cooking is my universe. I go to bed dreaming about it. I wake up thinking about it. Other than my family, cooking is everything to me. Cooking is a very passionate, primal thing for me. It's very fun to work with things and see the chemistry behind them. I'm very much focused on a natural type of cooking style, accentuating what the product or vegetable or anything is versus manipulating it. My cooking style is very simple, very rustic. When I look to food, I look for the ingredient first. And what I try and do is not to make too much of a, a mess of the ingredient. I get out of the way of the ingredient. When I think of Chinese food, I think of complexity, I think of uh, mysterious things, I think of technique-driven, hot, fast cooking. Sweet, sour, savory, bold, powerful flavors, very... Ancient, long, long history. A grandmother after grandmother after grandmother passing this beautiful food down. Rice, noodles, most things that you associate with Asian types of cuisine, but... I really don't have much of an understanding of it. I think of so many mysterious things when I think of Chinese food. I've never been to China before. I don't know very much about China or Chinese cuisine. I'm really excited to learn about it. I have never been to China before. We're going to be traveling in Chengdu City. In the Sichuan province. For two weeks. I think this trip is going to provide so many memories and such an adventure for me personally and professionally. I'm really looking forward to the challenge of having to be a part of a project where there's a focus on cooking but something that I don't know anything about. I'm also really interested to learn about the vegetable cookery. I truly believe this trip will be a great adventure for me. It's a cuisine I know nothing about. It's a, a people I know very little about. I always believed in the old adage of show me what you eat and I'll, I'll show you who you are. So I'm very curious. I'm really excited. I can't wait to go to China. Well, I'm so pumped up and ready for this trip. I cannot wait. I'll see you there. It was interesting to taste something that you knew was homemade. I could go back and eat and eat and eat. There is the biggest walk I've ever seen in my life. There are only a thousand pandas left in the world. 80% of them are originating in this place. I found a place here that was on a very high level as a food destination. I think we're looking at a very powerful cuisine, and I think we're going to see a lot more of it. Hello, 
nice people. This is our first day in Chengdu. This morning we went to Chen Mapa Tofu. The restaurant is 140 years old. Started in 1862. That's unbelievable to me. We went into the kitchen. The line was very different from a Western setup. So many interesting things for a Westerner to look at. The dish specifically that was so curious was the mapu tofu. I've heard of this dish and I've tasted this dish in San Francisco. It's one of the few dishes that I did recognize, but what I've had before was very different from what we had today. And I thought it would be a very hard, fast cookery, but it was more of a very delicate and intentional cookery. He was very comfortable and very exacting in the dish. Knew exactly how much oil to put in and to take out. Knew exactly how much chili to put in and then back off. Very much watching the pod and moving things very carefully and with a lot of purpose. We got to learn about the ingredients of the dish. I was surprised to see how many there were, including beautiful homemade tofu, which held its shape. He used beef, which I thought would be pork automatically. There was a chili powder, Szechuan pepper, chili paste, white pepper, there was black pepper, lots of garlic, poison sauce, fermented black beans, and he used a little slurry of cornstarch to put the whole thing together. And also these beautiful little like garlic shoots. And uh, we were expecting to have our heads blown off by the amount of chili in this dish. The dish was outstanding. It was really nice. layered and you could taste everything. This is a completely different flavor profile, especially the, the peppercorn, the numbingness as a part of the whole dish and the flavor. Oh. Oh. We went back in the kitchen and saw them prepare the dandan noodle. It's a gathering of ingredients. With a little bit of onion and a little bit of meat. With a complexity of chili and fat, which I thought was quite interesting as well. Another addictive kind of eating dish. Sesame oil, salt, chicken stock, and chicken bouillon, hoisin sauce, and a bit of vinegar, like a Chinese black vinegar that I've never tasted before. I thought it was quite interesting. The peanut butter was a very underlying flavor. The way that the noodles had this starch to them, it kind of bonded with the sauce and made it very enjoyable to eat. Garlic hits and chili hits, and of course that Szechuan thing. My mouth has been numb all day, and I'm actually starting to quite enjoy it. So this afternoon we went to visit the Wafu restaurant, which is within a hotel. It's up on the seventh floor. We met Chef Wang. He seems like a very young person, but he's running kind of a big show. He has a staff of 50 cooks and I have 12. It was just such a different perspective, but also so many things that were so similar. He seemed to be really intrigued with what our philosophy was of cooking fresh and local and seasonal food and we expressed what, how different it was from him cooking food that was so authentic and had such history to it. He proved his mettle in the kitchen. It was so amazing to watch him cook on the walk. Moving that piece of equipment on top of an incredible flame, just hot, hot, hot situation and coaxing great flavors out of these dishes. It's so different from cooking in just a pan on a stove. It makes me want to learn how to cook on a walk now. I feel like I'm missing a skill. Another way to say it is just a bad dude in the kitchen. He cooked four different dishes for us, and each one was more interesting than the next. He did a very simple dish in the beginning, which I thought was quite tasty, kind of a, a very maternal feeling dish. So obviously this guy has those kind of feelings. A millet congee, which is the, the rice porridge, but done with millet, which I thought was kind of a twist. Beautiful yellow color, some flowering cabbage on top of that. So that was a wonderful dish. I like the greens. The greens are cooked very nicely. And then he did this great fish. It was a river fish called tench, which I'd never heard of before. Kind of a bony little fish, about this big. It was a freshwater fish, which generally has more of like a mucky, muddy flavor to it, but it was actually very silky and clean. And on top of that, tons of uh, beautiful green and red chilies with beautiful cubes of ginger, Kung Pao chicken, which everybody's had Kung Pao chicken, but not this Kung Pao chicken. It was so different from what I knew of Kung Pao chicken in the American style. 
soft, soft meat. The complexity of the different textures and everything was really interesting. It had a lot of acid to it. Oh, I just got the Szechuan. No. <laughs> the bamboo dish, though, was what really stood out to me. It was so delicate and clean and fresh. Bamboo shoots, which I've never had before. Those bamboo shoots were so crispy and delicious, I could just eat them all day. I can totally understand why panda bears are so into these things. Makes sense to me. It's very good. This is a, an awesome once-in-a-lifetime experience for me. I'm walking into uh, kitchens where the tradition is 3,000 years old. I come from a tradition of 10 years old or 15 or 20, you know. When we talk about the, the old days, this is blowing me away. It really is so exciting. An incredible day today. Uh, this was our day to spend the morning at the Chengdu New East Cuisine School, which uh, is interesting to me. I was also raised in a culinary school at the beginning of my career. And it kind of was very reminiscent of going to culinary school, but in a very different structure. This was very big. It was much bigger than the school I went to. 5,000 students over three campuses in Chengdu, all dressed in their various uniforms. The blue for the bakers, the yellow for the cuisines of all of China, and then uh, of course the red for the Szechuan, which red with the chilies makes sense to me now. I wasn't really expecting to walk in and see a crowd of students sitting there, but I really liked the idea of them all starting their day together. We went up on stage and it was a very informal thing, but we got up and we you know, were clapped at, and uh, a couple of hundred kids asked us some very interesting questions about how does uh, it feel to work in America? What's the difference between Chengdu and San Francisco? How do we feel about Chengdu? It was really fun to talk to all the young students. Remember how much you love cooking. Don't forget that because it's a lot of hard work. It is a, a privilege and an honor to feed people. It's a very important craft. We were also then inundated after we got off the stage and, and much applause, which made us feel like rock stars today and it was kind of a surreal experience. I've never been the focus of attention like that. Going to the class, though, was really the highlight of the day for me. In front of us was this really great show. Chef Xu has written books and has uh, documentaries uh, on him in China. And he produced a few dishes for the whole class. Fish taste chicken and then twice cooked pork. Cleaver is something we usually chop up bones with in my kitchen and it was nice to see him using it for everything. One of the things that intrigued me most was that the chef was taking it to a lighter way. He wasn't using a lot of oil and he was also not using MSG. He'd worked in foreign kitchens and was trying to be more helpful. And uh, that was a cool thing to see. The pork dish was great. Jessica, my partner in crime here, got to actually cook that dish with him. I've never cooked on a walk before, which was a really great chance to do that in a classroom with someone who's used to teaching people. So it was less intimidating in that way. The hardest part for me was how to hold the walk. It wasn't necessarily that it was heavy or anything like that. It's more that it's it's awkward compared to the pans that we're used to holding in Western culture. Awesome. So we're here at the Chengdu Cooking School, and this is my first time cooking Chinese food, and we made twice cooked pork on the wok. It's a very different cooking experience. You can't toss the pan around like you would think, and it's a very different heat and everything. It was a whole new experience in cooking. <laughs> and then I got to cook a dish that I will definitely cook again, fish taste chicken. Chef showed me it must be the thickness of a, a chopstick. First Chinese cleaver in my hand, butterfly it open and then score it. So we score it one way and then score it the other way. And the idea is that when you marinate this, it took on the flavors into the crevices of the meat. So we started off by taking this slurry of 
a little bit of egg white and cornstarch and mixing it together. And then loading the wok with oil. And then one by one feeding it into this beautiful oil. And it started to bubble and get crispy. And before it was totally cooked, but just getting crispy, we took it out, let it drain, and then frying it once more. So one is a deep fry, and then one's a shallow fry. After that is crispy and delicious, it's put aside to a plate, and then we make this beautiful sauce. Adding ginger and the scallions and the scallion tops. We chowed it, you know, moved it around in the pan, moved it around the pan, and when everything was done, a little bit of stock, and then a little bit of cornstarch to thicken it up. Vinegar. 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 Ah, uh, how about it, Oh, real good. <laughs> and that whole thing presented onto a plate, and then the sauce, which we put on top of the chicken. Delicious. So this is the first dish I've cooked in Chengdu, uh, in a wok. This is uh, fish taste chicken, and taught to be by my new uh, chef and friend. Thank you. Xie xie, xie xie. We've arrived back in the city center of Chengdu, and we're at Hans Bans. We found out that this restaurant's been established for 80 years. And they do things the old-fashioned way. These guys right here. Supposedly, there are two master chefs that still make this in the city today, and we were honored to work with one of them this afternoon. They started with the whole cut of pork, the shoulder, and then watching them break it down. Not looking at his fingers, every single element perfectly, perfectly dealt with. Uh, took all this pork and ground it in front of us. Season the meat. With vinegar, with soy, with sugar, with salt, with Szechuan pepper, with uh, white pepper, with ginger. The ginger was pulverized in a blender, which I thought was interesting because it was so fine and ground up that you didn't have chunks or like a grating, but it still added a lot of texture to the meat. Measuring it by eye and by feel, and obviously has done this thousands and thousands of times, and just kept mixing and mixing and mixing and mixing. He was so knowledgeable of what he was doing, and he could tell by the smell of it that the seasoning wasn't quite there. I was watching this thinking that, okay, it's mixed. And then I realized what he was doing is really emulsifying that meat to get to a very specific texture. And then he packaged this meat and put it away. Then the exciting time, a kid, a 29-year-old kid who's been doing this for 10 years, took this dough, this beautiful, supple, fluffy dough, fed it through a sheeter, rolled it as you would a baguette. And watching them work the dough when they were making it, you could see that they were building so much structure of it. And then you taste that when you eat it. Amazingly, I was astounded. One by one pulled off these beautiful pieces of the dough that would be the perfect, perfect weight. I think if we weighed them, they would have been about an ounce a piece, but not an ounce and a half or an ounce and a quarter, but an ounce a piece. And then put flour on top of them, patted them out into perfect little rounds, took the perfect amount of meat on chopsticks, stuck it right into the center of this dough, and proceeded to make the most incredible shape with just using his fingers like a speed demon. They made it look so easy. We um, <laughs> had the opportunity in front of the whole kitchen to try this ourselves, and it was you know, pretty much a disaster. Making the buns today was really great because it was so humbling and you just hilarious in a way at how bad we were at it. I have to say we got better at it, but certainly not the expert of 10 years of uh, a perfect fluted pastry. It was just wonderful to see. These go into a steamer at the end of this, and about 10 minutes later, uh, eight minutes to be precise, were uh, pulled out, and we sat down and we ate this masterpiece. To eat them afterwards was great. It was what cooking is all about for me. It's like what you put into it and everything that goes into every little detail of what you do. It was really a reminder of what it all means.
But today was really a once in a lifetime experience. What we did today was opposite of what we've been doing in Chengdu, and that is uh, we didn't touch food. We started off this morning in the Chengdu Giant Panda Base Research Center. <laughs> They're an animal that has survived 8 million years and most species last 5 million years so they've definitely adapted and evolved a lot. We walk out onto a bridge, we cross this bridge. Right when we got off we saw a panda outside. That's a live panda. It's not a little puppet, it's not Kung Fu Panda, it's a real panda, that's so crazy. We didn't know, but that was the only time we would see one outdoors, so it was a really special moment that lasted kind of through the whole day. There are only a thousand pandas left in the world. 80% of them are originating in this place, and in fact they have over 50 in the center. After that we saw other pandas, but they were mostly indoors. They lie like big, big, lazy dogs surrounded by bamboo, just eating and eating and eating and eating. I did notice how dexterous they were. They can open up that bamboo, no problem, get right to the center with just a flick of the paw and a you know crunch of the tooth, and they're inside the center of the bamboo. And so they look quite delicious, actually. They eat 30 kilos of bamboo a day. That's crazy. They only digest about 20% of it, but still, that's a lot of roughage, you know? so their nutrients are very low in how much they're eating. So it's kind of changed their temperament too, where they're very happy and relaxed and playful animals versus being very aggressive. They also like solitude, which I found interesting. At five years old, they become very reclusive. They really like to spend time alone and just be happy and lethargic and have their own little life. I also learned that if you want to offend somebody in China, you can call them a lazy panda. So I haven't done that yet, but that's on my plan. And then we went to the breeding center and saw the babies, and they were two weeks to a month old. They're like a tiny, tiny little puppy. That's one thousandth the size of mama. They're like a hundred grams. It's really remarkable. You would expect them to be like little cubs. But every single day, they grow another hundred grams. They double their size. So about five years into it, they start to get very, very big. In fact, a grown panda is almost my size, 220 pounds. The facility is really remarkable. The work that they've done has really rehabilitated the population of pandas. It's hard to get them to mate naturally, so they do a lot of artificial insemination. What's cool about this place is that their success rate over the last you know, 20 years has become almost 90 to 100 percent, so they're doing a great job. What was crazy is the red panda. We were in an area where the red pandas were indigenous to, so they weren't behind any sort of enclosures. Right in front of us, we could actually walk up to this panda. We were told that they might attack every once in a while, so very hesitantly we got to about three feet away from this guy. And then maybe another hundred feet, we arrived on another panda. Big fluffy tail, looked like a fox and a raccoon had made it and made this beautiful big animal eating pumpkin just in front of us like we weren't even there. So later in the day we drove to Qingchong Mountain. Green, lush, and very, very tall. It's really captivating and it was so different from what we had been seeing in Chengdu. When we started climbing the stairs, I didn't really know what to expect. It's very hot here, and very, very sticky, and very humid. But as we started to climb this mountain, step by step by step, the air got a little bit thinner, and a little bit cooler, and the humidity started to go a little bit away. Everything is so different up here. The air, the water, the humidity. So we kept going another 3,000 feet and reached the Tianshi Temple. Named after a Tao master who was around 1,300 years ago when this temple was built. To think of how many people have walked through the gates was really a fun thing to think about as you're walking up all the steps into the square. It's gorgeous. Dark wood, there's stone everywhere. I couldn't help feeling that I was sort of trespassing a little bit in history. 
Inside the temple, there are so many things to enliven your senses, including smell. There's altars with incense burning and candles, and it's a very powerful place to walk into. This is a very, very old religion, and people come here to worship, but at the same time, they're very accepting of a Westerner walking into their sacred space. I found that fascinating. It was very much a cultural experience today to get to see everything and experience it and be outdoors, which was great, and to feel the environment and kind of take everything in with every breath and see how vastly different it is between the nature here and the city. And I feel very grateful to have gained this sort of perspective. Day four in Chengdu, I think the best culinary day we've had so far. This morning we came to the Jinjiang Hotel and we went up to the Sichuan restaurant. <music> Chef Diao has been a part of this company for 32 years, but he just recently opened this restaurant in the new part of the hotel that specializes in specifically Sichuan cooking. This man stands at the altar of Sichuan cuisine and he stands there quite grandly and fiercely and he is here to protect that cuisine. And he's very concerned that it's being manipulated and not represented well all over the world and even here in Sichuan. He showed us two dishes today. The first dish that the chef prepped and cooked for us was fish smelled pork. A dish that's kind of become one of our favorites. We eat it at every meal and he's kind of the master, so we wanted to learn how to make it from start to finish. This was somebody who'd been doing this for obviously 30 years and it showed, it showed in the preparation, so carefully using that cleaver to mince everything into perfect shape. That was really fun to see him do each cut. He was so effortless. To take those ingredients and to expertly use his wok the right oil, the right fry, the right sauce making to, to enhance each texture. We also learned that the name, fish smell pork, it's referring to the chilies that are in the dish. They're pickled and there is river fish in the pickling. So that's the fish taste that gets imparted into the dish, but there is no actual fish in the dish. And when that arrived at the table, we couldn't stop eating it. It was absolutely addictive. This dish had a perfect representation of what I think he was talking about when he talks about history and love of the craft and uh, tradition. Best version. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I want to eat the whole thing. <laughs> it was interesting to taste something that you knew was homemade and the love that he put into that was really great to pick up on so easily. I was astounded by this and um, couldn't stop eating this elegant dish with these beautiful, elegant chopsticks. In fact, I, I sort of coined a term. I was licking my chopsticks. It's a new one. The second dish that he prepared is a dish that is a little modern. Crispy rice with fresh squid. Now that's the twist. So this was a pork dish that he had replaced the pork with squid. Ocean fish is not available or accessible in this area. So he told us that everything else is local except for the squid, which he added because his customers were more interested in seafood dishes. He opened up this flat fish and scored it at an angle with this huge cleaver, missing his fingers, and then scoring back again the other way, and then cutting into small strips. When quickly flash fried, these turned into beautiful little porcupine shapes. Also, the aromatics were cut into very large pieces, very beautiful knife cuts. Bamboo shoots, thinly sliced, paper-thin button mushrooms. This was a technique-driven dish, for sure. Really, the star of that dish is the rice. It's the, the crispy part on the bottom of the rice pot. The Chinese cooks call it goba. He had cut it into circles, and then he dried those circles out a little bit, and then those were fried in oil just before the dish was finished. At table side, putting the crispy rice with a little bit of oil at the bottom where it made a tiny little bit of a sizzle and then pouring the squid stew basically on top of this when it made it bubble and sizzle and so come alive. There was movement in the dish itself and I think we'd figured out a technique. And in eating it was also a revelation, soft squid. Squid is something that it's very easy to make chewy if you cook it too little or too much. So it was great that he found that balance in between that tenderized it really well. Tender.
Mm. The sauce is so good. Okay. Crispy rice. It's still crunchy. Mm -hmm. Oh, super crunchy. A little bit of spice from chili, the earthy mushrooms. We were taken to another level, elevated. That dish really stood out. It was something very different from anything we had tasted so far on the trip. It had a sweeter undertone to it. It was really, really enjoyable. Something that brought in the spectrum of what the cuisine here can be. So this afternoon we went to Shu Chiu Sheng. It's a hot pot restaurant and it's privately owned. They have 10 locations. This is the hot, spicy thing that we've been hearing all along about Szechuan cooking. And so spicy that people sweat. And why do they eat hot pot here? It's because it's damp here, it's humid, and the body gets humid. And eating these, these spicy things, specifically hot pot, is a way to get that wet out of the body. It's a philosophy here that I, I understand now. It makes a lot of sense. So we walk into this room and nervously sit at this table and these people start to bring us the hot pot itself. We're quite nervous, to be honest with you. This is a, maybe a Western nightmare. And it's just the broth and the entire surface is covered in Sichuan peppercorns and chilies and it's just really intimidating. Then you mix your little bowl of your own sauce. And in that bowl is a little bit of oil with garlic. So it's like a garlic oil bowl. And you can adjust that bowl to how you want to eat it. And you add fresh onion and cilantro, soy sauce, vinegar, salt, and you dip your things in there as you do and it adds the acidity to it and the saltiness to it. Because what's coming out is heat. But what you can do is add the acid to it to make it balanced. And I thought that was very, very ingenious. The servers start to bring out these crazy platters, things that in the West we don't see, or if we see, we don't see them for long. Pork intestine, pork lung, duck intestine, beef intestine, <laughs> pork tripe. I was getting very nervous and I was knew this was going to be a really big challenge for me, but it, that it was something that I should really overcome and just face forward and Lawrence was really, really supportive. He was like, you're here, you have to do it. Just don't think about it, it's going to be great. When in Rome, I mean, sorry, when in Chengdu, uh, we must. There were things that we understood like uh, tofu, oh, tofu, but this one is stuffed with fish. Long strips of celtis. Thinly sliced fatty beef, a marinated beef, pork ribs, which were great. And I have to say, as intimidating as today was, I really loved it. I can't wait to try and replicate it at home. They were very generous and gave us packets to take home so we can make the hot pot at our house. And I'm really excited to kind of expand on it and try different things within that broth. It wasn't as spicy as I thought it was gonna be, but I can see how this could be such a party. 10 of you around this pot, taking hours and hours to enjoy this meal. I love it. So today we came to the Jin Li Ancient Street, which is designed in the Qing Dynasty style. And it's an area that's been about commerce for a long time, but they've rebuilt it to kind of instill and maintain that style. My fear was it would be a fake representation, but not at all. These were the real deal. These were artisans presenting their wares. We arrived as the sun was starting to set. Every shop is different as you walk through past windows from women's clothing to carved ornate chopsticks. There's gourds that have been hollowed out. Some have calligraphy on them. There's a lot of folk art from the area. I managed to walk into a little calligraphist and I got to pick up a beautiful brush start to do a tiny little bit of really badly done calligraphy, but it was a very deep experience.
There's just a lot going on here. Restaurants, bars, tea houses, everything that kind of encompasses the culture all along these winding roads. And there's fruit stalls everywhere you go and very original to this area, street snacks. A lot of skewers and little things that you can eat while you're walking. We were lucky enough to try a beef skewer. There's lots of treats and sweets and sugary things, and there's one that we actually had when we were out in the countryside the other day. It's like a crunchy sesame millet peanut sugar thing, so I'm really excited to take that home and share that experience with everyone there. We walked over beautiful bridges. They sort of escape the bustle of these crowded streets. The lighting here is really beautiful with all the red lanterns. It was really great to capture all the dark alleys lit by just the red lanterns. It was really just a beautiful scene here. So this morning we drove a little bit outside the main part of the city to go visit Sunshine Organic Eco Farm. They've only been farming for about three years on the location, their first plot. They started in 2010, so now it is officially technically organic, certified organic. And this is a recent development, so they're just sort of experimenting through this. This is an unusual process, not common to this area at all. It was really fun to get to see an organic farm. That's something that's been an ongoing discussion between me and Lawrence this whole trip is, what are the Chinese food systems like? What, is, what are the restrictions? Is there an organic movement here? Because it's something that we both are very passionate about, especially being in the San Francisco area where it's very prevalent. So to get to go and experience an organic farm was a really great way to tie all of that discussion together. And there's a gentleman named William, who is the son of a contractor who'd come into town and decided they'd fallen in love with a small parcel. And when they proposed to buy this parcel and turn it into an eco-friendly town, the government basically said, if you're going to start a, an eco-town, you need some sort of farm attached to that. And that is how they sort of stumbled onto eco-farming or organic farming. If they can sell these vegetables, if they can create a market for this, then maybe this part of China can step into what we are so much running through in the States right now, especially on the West Coast. They've so far gone about 200 different varietals, also medicinal plants, but that's about 15% of what they do. The rest are crops. They think so far their best crops have been tomatoes and cucumber, strawberries for sure. We saw corn, we saw spinach, we saw cabbage, all in these hoop hothouses that really, really retain the heat. I mean, even hotter than it was outside today, and today was sort of a record-breaking day of heat. And they're really investing in that community. That was really kind of apparent when we saw all the kids and they were teaching the children how to plant the pot with probably cabbage or something. It's something that they do all the time is get the kids involved, which I thought was really great. <laughs> After the farm, we drove back into the city and came to a place that almost is kind of re reminiscent of the night market, where it's an alley corridor with a lot of commerce going on. And we walked down through the street and came to Yu Family Kitchen. They don't just open to the public. You have to make a reservation. And you have to only book for one of six tables in this place. So it's, it's quite exclusive. And as we came in, there's a beautiful courtyard. This must have been a beautiful house to live in, and now it is recreated into a beautiful space to dine in. And it's 
Chef Yu and his wife and their partners in the restaurant. They built it together. I didn't realize that this is where we were coming today, but this chef is actually the only chef that I went preparing for this trip heard of. So when we got here today and saw his chef coat with the name, I was really excited that we actually were gonna meet him. He likes to modify recipes and he's more about, this is Chengdu now. This is the modern time of this cuisine. We don't have to follow every single rule. We just need to maintain the prestige of what the cuisine is and what it's meant to this place. And when we stepped into his very, very, very disciplined kitchen, you could see that uh, he was a very serious man, very serious about his craft. And Chef prepared two dishes for us. At first he took a river fish and he seasoned it with a little bit of salt and a peppercorn infused oil and then dredged it in cornstarch. And then quickly flash fried that. Then he reserved the fish and he made a broth with ginger, whole cloves of garlic. There was a fish stock that was the base of it all and he took that and cooked it in the wok for a while but then switched it out to a smaller braising pan which was really interesting to see and put it on a low heat on a burner added some pork to it and other ingredients to really concentrate the flavor and then he proceeded to put the fish in there but only for a quick while just to finish the cooking process and kind of reinforce the fish flavor into it and then after that, he took a consomme and he poured consomme over the fish. Sort of a Western technique in my upbringing of clarifying the stock. It was duck and chicken and scallops. You know, basically see-throughs. Consomme is a very classic French technique. It's very nice, really clean. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Consomme. And steam this. After steaming that for quite a while, he uh, drained the consomme off and put a new consomme on top of it. Same thing, but his idea was that he was going to do this three or sometimes four times when he serves this dish usually. He wanted it to be so pure, the consomme in the fish. He also, to the side, prepared a sauce, which the base was the same consomme with a lot of ginger and it had a little bit of sesame oil and some vinegar in it and it was a really bright, bright flavor balanced sauce and you take the fish out of the broth that it's in and you dip it into the really strongly flavored sauce. It was really beautifully done. It was a lot of time and patience going into a dish. The other dish that he prepared, I was very excited about because it was prepared with uh, squash tendrils, the top ends of the squash plant versus the actual fruit of the plant. We don't use those in my restaurant. We don't have access to them, but it's something I will go back and hunt out because I know they're around. So he took the greens and he blanched them in boiling water and then strained them off and reserved them. And then he started a little saute with bacon uh, or pork belly. And some chicken stock and then cornstarch slurry to thicken it into a sauce. And then he cooked the greens within that and that was the whole dish. It was really just about showcasing the tendrils. When it came down to eat the dishes, taste these dishes, we were ushered into a, a small room. There was a table. In the middle of the table were square porcelain dishes with a representation of the absolute skill of the kitchen. Very beautiful and orchestrated and choreographed. And I really appreciate that choreographed service. It's something that, and again, really resonates with my experience in cooking. And these were just basically for us to see and then they were promptly removed. The first dish was really whimsical. It was calligraphy brushes, and we had actually experienced that last night at the night market. Lawrence actually tried writing with it. It piqued my interest, especially when our server graciously said, now go ahead and eat those. The very tops of the brushes were pastry, and we dipped them into sort of a tomato-style sauce, and you got to eat this little pastry, which I thought was really whimsical and really fun. One bite, really light, crisp, nice, acidic from the sauce flavors. It would be a great talking point in a group of people, I'm sure. Just something kind of silly to start out the night and kind of set the tone for the surprises that were going to be coming. And that was followed very quickly with a beautiful, look like a gallo, of smoked duck. It had these little bread that were like a pocket. 
it's what you opened up, and inside you put a little bit of onion and a little bit of sliced cucumber, and then pulled the duck and uh, dipped it into a uh, dark hoisan style sauce into the bun and got to eat that. Obviously the chef has talent, obviously the chef, the chef is an artist, but he's also a funny guy and that is fun to see. These are uh, pumpkin tendrils, or pumpkin greens. Very clean and really showcases the flavor of the squash shoot versus masking it with a heavy sauce. That's great, still got great texture too, still got a nice crunch. The fish is so smooth and delicate, it just melts in your mouth, it's really nice. The coating on the outside though also gives it a little bit of texture and then the sauce is so balanced, it seasons everything, but you still taste the duck and the chicken and everything coming from the consomme as well. Such a fun idea to be able to play with your food for a little bit as well, so to remove from one dish to the next to bring back to your mouth. Um, so you really have to interact with the dish a little bit. The broth is just really, really the base of this whole thing. It's the, the backbone of the dish, and uh, it's just so clear and clean, lovely. So today we came to the Xuanxing Tea House. The attention to detail is amazing and the cost must be astronomical. It's roughly about 24,000 square feet. One place feeding up to 1,400 people. This place is a massive structure and they have created very intimate settings even though it's a very large production. The rooms are all lit very low with lanterns and it's very nice, it creates a very nice ambiance. A lot of the lights actually had a tea motif, which is very interesting. Big, big, big lights with like upside down teacups. A pond that was lit with beautiful teacups as well. Wood carving in every direction, everywhere you looked. A huge, huge crew, 340 staff. 108 of those are in the kitchen alone. They have three kitchens. There were rows and rows and rows of walk stations. There is the biggest walk I've ever seen in my life, and I haven't seen a lot, but these were massive. Two men to handle carrying this thing around, just giant. After touring the kitchen, we were led into a really interesting place. Almost, I would say, a modern museum. Even as you're walking through the hallways, they're dark, but the art is all lit up. My favorite thing, though, were the old pictures, the old photos. There was also a lot of old art, ancient art. And there were masks. You come towards the end to this huge stone carving on the wall, and it was actually carved onto the wall here. It took the artist six months to complete it. It's in a very old style and it portrays this whole community. We were ushered into this gorgeous, gorgeous room. And they're laid out in a pattern of sweet and savory with no distinction between them. It was sort of a surprise every time you put something in your mouth, which direction it was gonna be. There was salty, sweet, bitter, and you kind of went around the table and your palate went up and down and in all these different ways and it really kept you intrigued to keep tasting. The portions are really small so it really kind of entices that sort of conversational eating with small portions. I could go back and eat and eat and eat and eat these things. I think this is also a great representation of dan dan noodles and that's what I've been looking for. Sort of a clean, easy to eat version of these noodles where the meat was crispy and interesting and the noodles were perfectly cooked. The highlight for me was definitely there was a fried noodle like ball and it was filled with purple sweet potato and that was just outstanding. I could eat those every day. You had to figure out what it was as you were eating it and the texture of the crunch of the noodles was unlike anything we tried here but also unlike most things I've had to eat just in general. We were lucky enough to have a, a small private showing of a gentleman with his many masks on. And there we were, not 
five feet away from this guy. And I was flummoxed. I couldn't figure out how this guy was changing his mask so fast. A master. Still don't know how he does it. If I were to bring anybody to Chengdu, I would bring them to this place. In the food, in the art, in the antiques, you have a reality of what this place was, and what this place is, and what this place will be. A complete story in Chengdu. final day here in Chengdu. Today is a day that we've been looking forward to and not looking forward to. It was quite a challenging day for us. It's a day of our own personal, maybe uncomfortable feelings about cooking, cooking in China, cooking in a very strange new environment. We were going to prepare a dish, kind of from what we've learned from this trip. So first we went to a market this morning and that was really an incredible experience. We didn't really know what to expect. Was this going to be a supermarket, you know, a modern Western style market? Is this going to be a farmer's market, what I'm used to, going to a place where farmers gather to bring their wares? It was kind of a combination of both. Downstairs was the seafood in the middle and it was all live and fresh and that was really amazing to see it like that. In this culture, live is very important to the selling of something like fish, of course. So we had live eels and live frogs, live everything really. What I was intrigued with and what I was impressed with was it wasn't a fishy smelling place. This was a very clean place, which is unusual for a market of this caliber. Then around it was all the spices and sauces. <laughs> jars and jars of different vinegars and oils and the list goes on and on and on. Upstairs was all the produce in the middle and around the outside was all the meat, which was really interesting to see. And again, there was this lack of bad odor. Everything was, smelled very fresh. Beef, pork, chicken, duck. There's all different parts of the animal. You name the animal, they had it hanging in some way or some part of it somewhere in this market, usually on the outskirts. There was also cured meats, there was prepared things, they were making dumplings. It was really overwhelming, all the chili paste and vegetables, mushrooms, everything that was going on was just really fun to see. We started to gather our ingredients for our specific dishes. I bought a couple of spices, knowing full well that the school we were heading to had the majority of the spices we need. And then a ton of vegetables, more than I should have taken, honestly, for one dish. It was just a really, really fun experience. It kind of started the day off on such a great foot. We both were really excited and kind of forgot that we were nervous that we were going to be cooking and using a wok and things that we weren't familiar with. An hour later, two big bags in hand, we arrive at the culinary school. And it was the same cooking school that we went to, but at a different location. And uh, there we were on our great round cutting boards, and we started our French term called mise en place, the gathering of our ingredients, the preparation. We washed everything, did all our knife cuts, kind of started formulating how we were going to put everything together, the sauce work, and just kind of compiling all the ingredients we wanted and separating it all out and having it laid out in front of us so we had a better game plan. And luckily we got to use our own Western knives, so I have ten fingers still. Um, no cleavers involved, but I did buy a cleaver, so I will practice. I started with this concept of doing a dish called Szechuan inspired healthy vegetables and I wanted to add a little more texture in the form of a crunch so I deep fried some beautiful onion rings and I also wanted to get that little bit of Szechuan pepper hit in there so what I did in the dredge was I added a little bit of Szechuan pepper, ground Szechuan pepper into the flour and cornstarch and a little bit of chili as well and then my first technique on the wok was deep frying. After that was done, relatively successfully, I emptied the wok and started the process of building a multi-layered dish. 
And every single time I used this wok, I got a little more comfortable with it and a little more intrigued with it. I decided to cook all of my ingredients a little bit separately and basically made three or four different dishes with different flavors. So if I'd gone too far with the salt on one or the, too far with the acid on another, at the end I could combine them to sort of a cohesive dish. I thought that I'd tapped into something that I that had a taste memory over the last week. Tossed everything together, made about twice the amount I needed for a dish, with a little help guided my walk, and uh, plated this dish. I knew that I had good flavor, and I knew I had good textures. What I'd basically made was a big Asian stew. Olympics. The culinary gents, the, the chefs of the school, were very, very kind, I think, and they tasted my dish very quickly, and they gave it the big thumbs up. But I think they would have done that to anything I'd put on a plate. So um, I think they were very generous to us. I wanted to do something that really highlighted the numbingness, that unique numbing flavor from the prickly ash. Everything else that was in it, I kind of drew from different inspirations from this trip. The amaranth is something that I'm familiar with working with at home, but I also saw it at the farm and was surprised to see it here. The seltus, again, something familiar, but also it's from here. It's a Chinese vegetable, so to not use it here kind of seemed ridiculous to me. It had to be a part of it because it's something I really enjoy, and this is its origin. The squid was kind of an inspiration from when we were at the Jinjiang Hotel. The pieces of the melon and the mushroom and all of that was just kind of like a calming earth, more neutral flavors. The sweet potato leaves are something that I've had once before in the U.S. and was really surprised to have here. And it's something that I can't find in the U.S. So it was great to have such accessibility to a product like that and I really wanted that to be a part of my dish. And it's such a great thing to quick cook in the wok and nothing could cook it that way except for a wok because it's so hot so fast. I got a little bit caught up in what I was doing and maybe overcomplicated it a lot but I was really happy with the broth which I wanted to be the focus of the dish and that bitterness and kind of astringency and how those are the types of things that they focus on eating in the summertime because it cools your body within. <laughs> Jessica, how would we su summarize this trip I think, in just a few words? I think the best way to summarize this whole trip is numb, hot, fresh, and tasty, which are the four rules to Mapo Tofu. And I think that Chinese food in general, I think we're looking at a very powerful cuisine, and I think we're going to see a lot more of it 